Okay, let's open our Bibles to the Old Testament today. I'm going to throw a little curveball at you. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 52, starting in verse 13. And we're going to be studying all the way to chapter 53, verse 12. Isaiah 52, verse 13, all the way to Isaiah 53, verse 12. Now, again, for those of you who have been with us, we've been um, actually doing a chronological study through the Gospels. And uh, we've been in the Gospel of Luke for several weeks, almost a month and a half probably. And uh, I decided to take a bit of a break and do a kind of a detour and go to Isaiah into this section right here uh, with the idea that with all that you've been learning as we've been going through the Gospels, um, hopefully you're going to have a deeper uh, and understanding of Isaiah this passage that most of you have probably read, you're familiar with. Uh, so, but let's do this. Let's just read it together. I'm going to read through it, and then we'll break it down here, okay? Starting in verse 13. See, my servant will act wisely or will prosper. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, Nothing is in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace, shalom, was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. For we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears, he was silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he has poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Who was Isaiah talking about here? Jesus, huh? The coming Messiah the suffering servant, and the king of glory. And what I want to do today is I really want to break this passage down for you and help you to understand it because I'm not sure people truly, truly understand it. It's a very popular passage to read. In fact, it has been named or called, I should say, um, <laughs> the torture chamber for the rabbis because the rabbis who deny 
Jesus is Messiah? When you read this, how can you deny he's the Messiah? Thus, it's the torture chamber for the rabbis. Now, let me give you a little background here on Isaiah, if you want to take note. Let me give you five quick things here to help you. Now, Isaiah, without question, is probably, oops, where am I at here? I went too far. Okay, here we go. Isaiah is, without question, the most recognized prophet of the Old Testament, right? Uh, again, you've probably read this chapter several times. And that's because Isaiah is the most quoted Old Testament prophet in the New Testament. There are over 65 quotes from the book of Isaiah in the New Testament. Now, Isaiah, he was a prophet in and around Jerusalem in Judea during the time of 739 B.C. to around 686 B.C. And he ministered during the reign of four kings in Judea, King Uzziah, King Jotham, and for those of you who've been following our Old Testament study, you guys know King Ahaz, and one of the greatest kings of all time in Judah, Judea, King Hezekiah. And do you guys know how Isaiah died? Tradition tells us that he was sawed in two <coughs> under the reign of King Hezekiah's son, the wicked King Manasseh. Bet you didn't know that about Isaiah. Now, what's very interesting about the book of Isaiah is its parallel with the overall Bible. And I shared this, I think, about a month ago with you guys. I'm not sure you understood it. So I put it on PowerPoint, and I am indebted to Dr. John MacArthur for his great research on doing this. And so I borrowed this from him. And so Isaiah and the Bible have tremendous parallels. Let me show you what I mean. How many books in the Bible? Oh, gosh, this thing's going crazy, huh? 66 books in the Bible, right? Okay. How many in the Old Testament? 39. How many in the New Testament? 27. 39 books of the Old Testament talk about judgment because of our sin. 27 books in the New Testament talk about salvation from God and from our sin. Does that make sense? Now, how many books, how many chapters in the book of Isaiah? Take a guess. 66. Isn't it interesting? The book of Isaiah is divided the same way as the Bible. The first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah talk about God's judgment because of the people's sin. The last 27 chapters of the book of Isaiah talk about God's salvation for the people who have sinned. Now, it's very interesting. If you dig, start to dig down, gosh, this PowerPoint, huh? Uh... If you divide the 27 chapters of the good news of salvation in Isaiah, if you divide it in threes, you get nine, nine, and nine. Nine chapters, these nine chapters right here, talk about the temporal salvation of Israel. These nine chapters right here on the end talk about the eternal salvation of God's creation, the new heavens and the new earth. The middle nine right there talk about God's salvation for his people from their sin. It's soul salvation. Now, if you want to bore down even further in the middle right here of this nine, you want to find the middle, middle section of that middle nine right there. You know what it is? The section we're studying today. Isaiah 52, 13 through Isaiah 53, 12. And if you really want to bore down even deeper and go to the middle, 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 middle part of that section right there, you know what it is? Verses five and six which says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. Is that not amazing? You know what that should tell all of you? God's the author of his word. And it should also tell you that Jesus is the Messiah of his people. Isn't that great? Well, today what we're going to do is we're going to really go deep into this idea of suffering servant and king of glory. 
because that's what this section here talks about, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to break it down into four sections if you're taking note. I made A's for you, okay? We're going to see, number one, the announcement of the Father about the suffering servant and king of glory. That's going to be chapter 52, verses 13 through 15. We're then going to see the accomplishment of the Son. He, the suffering servant, and the king of glory. That is going to be chapter 53, verses 7 through 12. We're then going to take a look at the, ouch, agony of the people. And I think you're going to learn something on this. That's going to be chapter 53, verses 1 through 6. And then we're going to see something incredible, the anointing of the Spirit. And we're not going to see that in this section. We're going to see how it's connected to another section in the Old Testament in Zechariah chapter 12, verses 10 through 13, 1. Okay? Make sense? All right. So let's do this. Let's start out with the first part right now. And let's see the announcement of the Father about the coming suffering servant. Starting in verse 13. God the Father is speaking now. And he says, he's making an announcement. He says, see my, underline that word, servant, will act wisely. Actually, what it says in the Hebrew is, will prosper, will succeed. See, my servant will act wisely, will succeed. Now, your attention, please. In the Hebrew, the word for servant is the word ehved. Slave is what it means. And what God the Father here is saying is that his slave, God's slave, will come and will succeed. You get that? And then God says about his slave, he, the slave, will be, underline that word, raised, and lifted up, underline those words, and highly exalted, underline those words. Now, many scholars say, well, this is talking about Jesus when they say he will be raised, meaning he was resurrected, meaning that he'll be lifted up, he ascended to heaven. He will be highly exalted on the throne of heaven, okay? And certainly, that can mean that. However, if you dig down deep and you look at the Hebrew, what he's saying here is this, my slave will succeed, he will prosper, he will be high higher and highest that's what he's saying in the hebrew now why is that important because that combination of hebrew words is nowhere else found in the new Te old testament except one place keep your finger there go to isaiah chapter 6 Look at verse 1. This is Isaiah answering his call to be a prophet. In the year that King Uzziah died, remember we saw he was one of the kings uh, that Isaiah prophesied during his reign. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw who? The Lord, Yahweh. High, underline that word, and exalted, underline that word, seated on, underline that phrase, a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. You know what it says there in the Hebrew? Isaiah says, I saw God. I saw a vision of Yahweh. And he was high, higher, and highest. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With, their, with, two, uh, with two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling out to one another. What are those three words? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who, and the earth, the whole earth is full of his what? glory watch me here when in isaiah god makes his announcement he says my ekved 
my slave, God's slave will succeed. Why? Because he will be high, higher, and highest. The same Hebrew phrase that refers exactly to God. Do you know what God was announcing to the people? God's slave is God. Back to Isaiah 52. God says, see, my ekved will prosper, will succeed. Because this slave, my slave, is God. He will be high, higher, and highest. Yes, he will suffer humiliation, verse 14. Just as there were many who were what at him? Appalled at him. Actually, in the Hebrew, what it's saying is, just as there were many, Israel, who were appalled at you, in like manner they will be appalled at him. Appalled at who? At the slave of God, who is God. His appearance was so disfigured, referring to his face, beyond that of any human being. His form, referring to his body, would be marred beyond human likeness. Can you imagine? But his humiliation would lead to exalt, exaltation. So he will, underline that word, sprinkle many nations. The kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand your attention. Please, the word sprinkle in the Hebrew is a powerful word. It doesn't mean sprinkle like with water. It means to startle, to stun, to the point of shutting somebody's mouth. He, the slave of God, who is God? Though he would be humiliated to the point that people could not look at his face, it would be destroyed so bad. They could not look at his body. It would be battered and beaten so badly. Yet, he would rise from the dead. The, th the, gr the th uh, grave would be empty. He would ascend to heaven, seated on his throne. He will stun, shock, People to silence going, oy vey. We thought he was just a simple slave. And kings will shut their mouths because of him. You know, the kings who opposed him, who laughed at him, who, 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 who made up all kinds of things to go against him, they will be shocked and stunned in silence. Because God says, here's my announcement. My slave is coming, but he's God. Keep your finger there. Go to Psalm 2. God had the same announcement and message for the kings and the wealthy people and those who thought they were so great that they didn't need a savior. Look at verses 10 through 12. God said, verse 10, Therefore you kings be what? Wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his Son, submit to him. Believe in him. If not, he will be angry and your way will lead to destruction. For his wrath can flare up in the moment. But blessed are all who take refuge in him. Back to Isaiah 52. So that's it with section number one, the announcement by the father. Do you guys understand? The father said, my slave is coming. He is the slave of God, but he is God. High, higher, and highest. He will be humiliated, but he will be exalted. And people will be shocked 
into silence because of who he is and what he's done. Which leads to point number two. What did he do? Let's take a look at the accomplishment of what the son would do. Now watch me here. You guys understand this was all written about 700 years before Christ. Isn't this amazing? Let's look at the accomplishment of the son. Starting in verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Does that sound like anybody? He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. If you've ever seen an animal led to the slaughter, it is one of the most horrific experiences to watch. And it's one of the most horrific noises to hear. But Jesus, the Lamb of God, as he was being led to the slaughter, would not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And yet, who of his generation protested? Nobody. Even his own disciples abandoned him. For he was cut off from the land of the living. He died without even having children or any descendants. And why did this happen? For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. Remember, he was crucified between two criminals. You know what the people wanted to do with the criminals after they were crucified? They took them outside of Jerusalem and dumped them on a garbage dump. But God wouldn't let his chosen servant and slave be dumped on a garbage dump. Instead, he was buried with the rich in his death. Joseph of Arimathea in his tomb. Though he had done no violence, nor there was any deceit in his mouth, Yet it was the Lord's will to, underline that word, crush him. And to cause him to, underline that word, suffer. And though the Lord makes his life as an offering, underline those two words, for sin. He, the bond slave of God, who is God, will see his offspring and prolong his days because he's the resurrected king of glory. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has what? Underline that word, suffered. He will see the light of life and be satisfied, fulfilling his mission. By his knowledge, by him fulfilling the plan of the Father, my righteous servant, will justify, save many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, now God the Father is speaking, I, the Father, will give him, the Son, a portion among the great, because the Son is Megas. And he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he has poured out his life unto death, and it was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Three key theological words here you see in this section we just read. What was the accomplishment of the son? Substitution. He was punished in the place of his people. Intercession. He intercedes now in heaven on the behalf of of God's chosen, saved people. Securing and guaranteeing our salvation. His substitution and his intercession guarantees the third word, our salvation. You did not choose to be saved. You cannot lose your salvation. It is all of God's grace. And that's why God gets all the glory. Amen on that? Amen. Go to Hebrews chapter 7. Great passage to connect to what we just read. You can see the substitution, intercession, and salvation here. Look at verses 24 through 27. But because Jesus lives for how long? Forever. He has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to, underline that word, save partly, partially, a little bit, somewhat. He is able to save completely 
Those who come to God through him. Why? Because he always lives to what? Intercede. He's in heaven praying for you. So when the devil, the accuser of us, starts to accuse us before God, Jesus says, no, 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 no. I paid for the sins of Tom. I paid for the sins of Matt. I paid for the sins of my people. He intercedes for us. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike other high priests, he does, he does not need to offer sacrifice day after day, for his own, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Why? He sacrificed for our sins. What are those next three words? Once for all. When he offered himself substitution for us. Because we are all sinners. We need a savior. We cannot pay for our own sins. We are destined to go to damnation. But God the Father made an incredible announcement. My slave, the slave of God, who is God, is coming. Yes, he will suffer humiliation, but because he is God, the Megas one, he will experience exaltation. He will pay for the sins of my people, God said. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. He allowed himself to be hung on a cross. And as he hung there, God the Father in his love for us took our sins, placed them on Jesus. Jesus, who, by the way, is the slave of God and is God. High, higher, highest. And he took your sins and was punished for them in your place. Substitution. We're not talking about some loser who hung on the cross. We're talking about Ekmed, the slave of God who is God. And he went to the cross for you and for me. He died the death we deserve. But what happened three days later? He rose from the dead in exaltation, overcoming sin and death for us. And he offers us salvation as a gift. That's why it's called grace. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. He did it all for you. And when you say, I'm tired of trying to do it myself, I'm tired of trusting in myself or worthless religion to try to save me, instead I'm going to turn to Jesus and embrace his grace, you then are forgiven your sins in terms of that day of judgment. You're given the free gift of eternal life. You have life with God forever. And it's guaranteed because Jesus is able to save completely those who come to him. Why? Because of his intercession. He's in heaven praying for you. Your salvation's guaranteed. And that is the good news of salvation. That was the announcement the Father was making. That's the accomplishment the Son has done. But now we've got to go to the bad part. Back to Isaiah. the agony of the people. <clears throat> Verses 1 through 6, a passage you're very familiar with, but I think you need to learn it right now because I'm not sure you understand it. <coughs> Now, in order to understand it, I'm going to give you a little bit of, I'm going to give you some grammar tips, okay? There are two things you need to notice in these six verses. Number one, the verbs are all in the what? Past tense. And the pronouns are all plural. What do I mean by that? Let's just read through it real quick, and you can underline what I'm saying here. See if you can pick out the verbs, and see if you can pick out the pronouns. Verse one, who has what? Believed, Believed what? our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed 
He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We, all like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Why did I take you through that grammar lesson? You have to ask yourself the question. Who is speaking here? We saw in, ver in chapter 52 verses 13 through 15. The announcement of the father. He was speaking. See? My slave, Ekbed, will be, will come. Be high, higher, and highest. He's God. He'll suffer humiliation. He will rejoice in exaltation. He will shock the world. That's the Father was speaking. We then see the accomplishment of the Son. We see the prophet Isaiah prophesying on what was going to happen 700 years later. He prophesied that under the inspiration of God. So you understand that, right? But now when it comes to the agony of the people, we have to ask the question, who are these people? Well, are they talking, looking forward to what the suffering servant and king of glory would do? Or are they talking and looking back? Looking what? Back. It's in the past tense. And is it one person speaking? Or a group of people speaking? It's a group of people. All of the pronouns are plural. So what in the world is happening here? You want to know what's happening here? Zachar keep your finger there. Go to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah, minor prophet. Right after Haggai. And right before Malachi. You guys want to know what's happening? Zechariah chapter 12. Look at the second part of verse 10. They will look on me. The one they have, what, Tom? Pierced. Pierced. And they will, what? Mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. These are people looking back who said, we did not believe in him. Our forefathers didn't believe in him. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be as great as the weeping of Hadarimam in the plain of Megiddo. That's a place of war, by the way. And there's always weeping there. And those who look back and realize that they blew it, that they missed it, they did not trust in the slave of God who is God. They did not trust in the Father's announcement. They did not trust in the Son's accomplishment. They are agonizing as they look back. 
Verse 12, the land will mourn, each clan by itself, with their wives by themselves, the clan of the house of David and their wives, the clan of the house of Nathan and their wives, the clan of the house of Levi and their wives, the clan of Shammai and their wives, and all the rest of the clans and their wives. Back to Isaiah. Now let's read through verses 1 and 6, now understanding the context. These are people looking back and saying, who has believed our message? The message that came to us. Very few of us did. Very few of our forefathers did. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It was revealed to us. And we didn't pay attention. He, the suffering servant, the king of glory, grew up before him, the father, like a tender shoot, like a, like a sucker branch that people just cut. He was like a root out of dry ground that people just kicked. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him? Come on! The king? What kind of king was he? He didn't look like a king. He had nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Where was his entourage? Where was his crown? Where was his reputation? I can't believe it. He's the one and we missed him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. He was from Nazareth, a no-name town. We despised him. We rejected him. In fact, many of our rabbis wouldn't even say his full name. They would just say Jeshu, which means may his name be blotted out. And the other rabbis who would say his name, they would make fun of his name saying, Je Yeshu Je Yeshua, Ben, which means son, Pandera, which means he's a nobody. He was an illegitimate son of a Roman soldier who Mary had sex with. He was a man of suffering. Not just external, but internal. Can you imagine what we said about him? He was familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised. And we held him in low esteem. He was a nobody to us. Surely he took up our pain. He bore our suffering. And yet we considered him punished by God. We even helped God punish him. We remember what was written back in Deuteronomy 21. Cursed is anybody who hangs on a tree. We thought he was cursed by God. And we despised him. The slave of God who is God. We consider him punished by God, stricken by him, afflicted. We had no idea. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. The punishment that was supposed to bring us shalom, peace, was on him. And by his wounds, we could have been healed. We all like sheep. I can't believe it. We've all gone astray. 
each of us turned our own way. We ignored him. We rejected him. We despised him. And the Lord, the Father, has laid on him, the suffering servant, the King of glory, the iniquity of us all. Changes the passage a little bit, doesn't it? Can you imagine the agony the people were experiencing? I mean, there was an announcement by the Father, right? There was the clear accomplishment by the Son, right? Do you see how depraved we are as humans? The God of glory stood right in front of those people and they rejected him. <coughs> what would you have done if you were back there then? Better yet, what are you doing now? Go to John chapter 12. <coughs> Starting in verse 37. In the preceding chapters, you can read it on your own. Jesus multiplied fish and loaves, fed over 5,000 people, just men alone. He walked on water. He gave sight to a man who was born blind. He even raised Lazarus from the dead. He told everybody about who he was, what he was going to accomplish at the cross. And you know how the people responded? Look at verse 37. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not, what? Believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah, the prophet. Lord, who has believed the message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It was to us. For this reason, they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn or then I would heal them, God said. And Isaiah said this, verse 41, why? Because when he was writing under the inspiration of God, he saw Jesus' what? Glory and spoke about him. What are you doing with Jesus? This book right here is filled with the Father's announcements. This book right here is filled with the Son's accomplishments. This book right here is filled with a lot of agony from people who rejected him. What are you doing with Jesus the Christ, the suffering servant and King of glory? Is he just a name? Jeshu to you? That you just use when you curse? Or if you need some good luck? Otherwise, you act as though his name was blotted out of your life. Or is he some guy you go, yeah, this virgin birth, come on. Mary probably slept with, that's right, a Roman soldier. Let 
me ask you a question. Do you see why the people were agonizing looking back? What if you were Jesus? What would you do to those people? I mean, you know those people that treated him like a sucker shoot and a root in the ground? Despised him, ridiculed him, mocked him, made fun of his name and his mother? Basically calling his mother... Nothing better than a whore. What would you do with people like that? Especially if you're the king of glory. Especially if you rule and reign over everything and everyone. What would you do to those people? I mean, if you were the father and made the announcement, what would you do? If you were the son and did all those accomplishments, what would you do? I know what I would do. And I have a pretty good idea of what you would do. And guess what? It wouldn't probably be what the father and son did by sending the anointing of the spirit. What do I mean by that? Go back to Zechariah. <coughs> if you ever doubt God's mercy, God's compassion, God's forgiveness, God's love for you, all I want you to do is go to Zechariah chapter 12. Now that you understand the context. Because remember, we read a few moments ago, these are the people looking back who ignored the Father's announcement and who scoffed at the Son's accomplishment and therefore we're now agonizing. You know what the Father and the Son did? Look at verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Watch me, watch me up here, watch me. The house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You know which ones we're talking about. Hop down real quick to verse 11. These are the people weeping in Jerusalem. These are the people mourning all of the clans with their wives. The the clan of the house of David and their wives. The clan of the house of Nathan and their wives. The clan of the house of Levi and their wives. The clan of the house of Shema and their wives. And the rest of the clans and their wives. You know what God did? Instead of destroying them, you know what the Father and the Son did? They sent the anointing of the Spirit. And I, on verse 10, will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a what? Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Spirit of what? Grace and supplication. Watch me here. God, through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit would be poured out and He would be the Spirit of grace that would produce true what? Repentance. Even for those people who were in agony. Why? So even they too could be saved. And I will pour out on the house of David and its inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication so that they will truly repent. And then... They will look on me, to me, the one they have pierced. And they will mourn for him in repentance and seek forgiveness and gain salvation by the grace of God. 
but they're not just going to more feeling bad. They're going to have true repentance that's been poured into their hearts by the Holy Spirit. They will mourn as one mourns for an only child, and they will grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Probably not what you would have done to those people, right? You probably would have pierced them, wouldn't you? Do you see the mercy and grace of God? Pouring out His Spirit, His Spirit of grace, who would prompt repentance even in the most evil sheep who have gone astray and turned their own way. People like you and me. The father makes the announcement. The son has the accomplishment. And they pour out the anointing of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, on the people who were agonizing. Go to John chapter 16. Isn't that what the role of the Holy Spirit is? To take people like them and like you and me and to do something amazing. And look what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit, chapter 16, verse 7. But very truly, he said, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate or Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will what? Send him to you. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. When he comes, look what he'll do. He'll convict the world. He'll prove the world to be in the wrong about sin. No, you can't pay for your own sins. No, God doesn't ignore sins. He'll also convict the world of righteousness and judgment. God is a righteous, holy God. And he's a just judge who must punish sin. And we're all in big trouble if God punishes us. He'll convict the world about sin because people do not believe in him, in in Jesus. About righteousness because Jesus says, I'm going to the Father because he is the king of glory, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world, the devil, now stands condemned. Jesus said, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will do what? Guide you in all truth about Jesus. He will not speak on his own, Jesus said. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you of what is yet to come. He will glorify who? Jesus, not the pastor, not the people. He will glorify Jesus. That's the role of the Holy Spirit, to point to the one whom we pierced. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. And all that belongs to the Father is mine, Jesus said. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. And what does the Spirit make known to people? We blew it big time. We look back and we should agonize. But the Spirit produces a humble and repentant heart where we cry out for mercy, cry out for forgiveness, cry out for compassion, and by God's grace, He grants it to His people. People like you, people like me. And people, yes, even like the Jews who despised Him, rejected Him. And while He was on earth, didn't believe him. Go to Acts chapter 2 and we'll close here. It's here on the day of Pentecost, the day that Jesus promised God the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Spirit would come down on his people. And it was there on that day that the Apostle Peter, who, oh, by the way, denied Christ how many times? Three times. Was forgiven by Christ. 
was promoted by Christ and was here now preaching about Christ in the power of the Spirit. And watch what happens. Verse 36, he had a big crowd of Jews there in Jerusalem. Didn't we read about people in Jerusalem who'd be weeping and mourning because of the one who was pierced? Look what happens. Peter said, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were what? Cut to the heart. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. They were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? We rejected him. We didn't believe the message. The arm of the Lord was revealed to us. We considered him like a sucker shoot, a little root in the ground. We despised him, rejected him. He's from Nazareth. What kind of king is that? Where's his royal entourage? We even made fun of his name. What shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you, in the name of the Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Yes, even those sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and even for your children. Yes, your family line from where your fathers rejected the Messiah. This promise is for you. And for all who are far off, including us, Gentiles, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, Peter warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted this message were baptized and about 3,000 people were added to the church that day in Jerusalem. And there's your first Christian church right there. The anointing of the Spirit on a people who were looking back in agony because of what they had done and what they didn't believe about the Son who accomplished this great work to bring salvation to his people and didn't believe the announcement of the Father who said, my Ekbed, my slave is God and he's going to shock the world and he did. And a lot of people have been shocked into salvation because of it. Do you see the mercy and grace of God? So here's my question to you as I close. You heard the Father's announcement about Jesus. You've read all about the Son's accomplishment through his death and resurrection. You see that God is a forgiving God willing to grant grace and repentance to people who believe in the Father's announcement and the Son's accomplishment. Here's my question. What are you going to do with that right now? Are you going to trust in Jesus? Are you going to live for Jesus? You're going to learn to grow in your relationship with Jesus, serve him, submit to him, love him, put him first in your life, or are you going to reject Jesus? Let's pray. Oh, Jesus Christ, suffering servant and king of glory, we worship you and we praise you, Jesus, for your accomplished work at the cross. Father, we praise you for your clear announcement. We can't miss it. It's clear. Your word is truth. And we thank you. And God, the Holy Spirit, we thank you for your anointing. The spirit of grace and supplication that you have given us a heart to repent, to be saved, and we thank you. And I pray for each person here. Holy Spirit, you know where each person is right now. Those who are saved, do a work in their hearts right now that they would really live their salvation for your glory. Convict them. Convince them of your truth. Give them a passion to study your word more, to live 
more holy and to share your word more passionately. Holy Spirit, do your work in the lives of your chosen people right now. And for those, Holy Spirit, who have yet to come to Jesus, I trust you right now to do your work. Convict them of their sin. Convict them and convince them of the righteousness of God and judgment of God and convince them of the full and final accomplishment of the slave of God who is God, Jesus Christ. Save souls right now, I pray. We all want to enter into the Holy of Holies right now. We all want to worship you right now, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we want to do it with a clean heart, a pure heart, a heart that truly brings your glory. Help us, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name.